four long years I have been waiting to do that. You might get to wait four more. I know. <laughs> and now I realize that the Cubs are not in the games this time. But we made it to postseason, which is just a little bit more than some other teams could, could say for themselves. <laughs> so, just saying. So, as Pastor Kevin said, I'm Trish, and I think I might still be the Celebrate Recovery Pastor. I'll let you know on Monday. <laughs> but I'm very excited to share with you tonight, and I'm so glad that you're here. I want to invite you on a journey with me, uh, a journey of hope and faith through darkness, a journey of self-discovery and of God's grace and love. Jeremiah 29:11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this time together. Lord, I thank you for your word, Lord, and how it applies to each of our lives. Lord, I pray that tonight hearts would be opened. Lord, that healing would occur. Lord, that we would recognize that you have a perfect plan. Lord, that you have hopes and dreams for us. Lord, that you want to, to come alongside of us, Lord, and make our lives so much better. Lord, I ask that we would invite you in and that we would allow that to occur. Lord, we love you and we thank you for tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So in 2004, my husband Joe and I walked through these doors. We were a mess. We had three small children. We were both broken in our own ways, and our marriage was a disaster. But I want you to know that if you walked into Crossbridge here tonight and you are hurting or you are lost or broken or your life is a mess, you are absolutely in the right spot, and we're glad that you're here. What we found here when we walked through the doors was a hope that we had never known. We met a God that we had never experienced before in our lives. And finally, there seemed to be a light instead of a freight train. We met Jesus for the first time in our lives and truly had that relationship. Jesus met us right where we were. He took us by the hand. He helped us up. He forgave us and he helped us turn from our sins and gave us a better life, which he continues to provide for us today. The more we gave to God and the more that we surrendered to him, the better life seemed to be. But just because we have that relationship with Jesus doesn't mean that we're immune to hard times. I promise you, difficult times will come in your life. The Bible actually tells us over and over again to expect it. It's what we choose to do in those hard times that can make or break us. It's, it's the decisions that we choose during the hard time that will put us on a journey that is in darkness or in hope. So tonight, I'm here to share with you about a God that you can trust in and that you can find hope in. A God who is on your side and wants the best for you. A God who meets you right where you are without judgment. He's offering us a better way of life, a life that's full of love and grace, if we'll allow it. We have to allow him in. In December of 2013, I found a lump. It was a small, solid mass in my breast that changed my life forever. Now, being a nurse can be a blessing and it can be a curse. Um, so I was very happy that it only took me about a week and a half to call the doctor because nurses typically know the drill, we know the outcome, we like to self-diagnose, and we don't need a doctor. So I knew that it was like, you know, something stupid like an infection or a blockage or whatever was going on. Um, but I kind of felt that little nudging that we talk about. And so I thought, all right, I'm going to call and make the appointment. Um, so off to the doctor, Joe and I went and I was examined. And as she was leaving, she said, hope for the best. And I thought, really? Like, that's how you're going to leave me? What does that even mean, hope for the best? And I thought, okay, well, whatever. But I needed a mammogram ASAP. So Joe and I um, went over to, to schedule that. 
Um, and the process didn't really go that good. And um, it might have ended with me telling them something about they should get another mammogram machine and hire another radiologist. <laughs> so, yeah, that, uh, that nurse thing in me, I just, ah, uh, you know. So, but what I realize is that sometimes we have to recognize in our lives when God is trying to shut a door and try to get us to go the other way. His plan is always so much better than ours. And I was able to get the mammogram done much sooner elsewhere. I was actually having a Celebrate Recovery team meeting at my home the morning that the doctor's office called to tell me that the mammogram was bad and that I needed to have a biopsy and have some more testing done. So I called my husband into the bathroom and broke down. And I thought, oh, you know, and I tried to fix myself back up and act like everything was fine, and I went back into the meeting, but they knew that I had been crying, and they prayed with me. It's amazing how God knows exactly what we need and exactly when we need it, when we have no idea. I was so thankful to have them there and for them to be able to pray with me. We need to have our eyes open to all that God is doing around us. It's really easy for us to miss or dismiss what God is doing when we think that we can do this alone and that we don't need anybody else. But God never intended for us to walk our journeys alone. Never. We need each other. Finally, it was time to get my results. Stage one breast cancer. My mom grabbed my hand and started crying. And it took me about five minutes to process all that was being said. And then the first tear fell. But then I thought, wait a minute. A light bulb went on. God allowed this. Like, God is going to use this. God needs me to walk this journey. He's like opening this door because he wants me to, to relate to another group of people who have cancer. There's other hurting, broken people out there that I can learn to relate to and, and maybe help. And I thought, God has a plan. I was almost excited. I heard stage one breast cancer and I knew that if I had to have cancer, that was the best to have. And I thought, God's got this. And my family is gonna get to see how faithful God is and how much they can trust him, just like I do. God can use this to save my family. My journey can point to God's hope and love. Now I realize that this is not the usual response when you get bad news. Really not the usual response when you're told you have cancer. But please hear me on this. I am not making light of anyone's situation or pain. I recognize that there are people who have been affected by cancer either in their life or in the life of somebody that they love. I don't have the answers to why some win the battle and some don't. I know it's hard to be close to people who lose their battles. I have been there too many times. I have found it especially hard in my journey when I'm winning my battle to lose people close to me Who've, lose, who've lost their battle with cancer. That one, that's the hardest part, probably. I don't know why God allows it, but I believe that there's a reason for everything and that we may not have our answers until we see God face to face. But my goal today, tonight, is to share with you my experiences, and it's my prayer that you leave a little bit lighter than you came in. With that being said, I want to say that I don't and I never have thought that God gave me cancer. I believe that God allowed me to have cancer, and I believe that cancer can be used to show people the hope and the love of God. That, he is, that has always been my prayer. What God ended up doing through my cancer was so much more than I ever could imagine. Not only did he heal me of my cancer, but of myself and of my messed up thinking. Before I knew it, I was having surgery and sitting in the oncologist's office with Joe and my mom. I was anxious. I wanted to know the treatment plan. I wanted all the answers to every question that I had. I wanted to know I was going to be okay, and I wanted to know how long this was going to be. And I wanted all those answers that day, <laughs> in that order. But I want you to know that it's okay to take people with you and to ask lots of questions anytime you see a doctor. And if they don't like it, they might not be the right doctor for you. On my journey, I have walked away from three oncologists so far because I just felt like they have taken me as far as they can. 
This is your journey. Ask the questions. Pray about where God would have you and talk to people about any doctor that you're thinking about seeing for any reason. Don't be afraid to get other opinions, write down questions, and make sure you get the answers. I actually had one of my oncologists walk out of the room as I was asking the question. So, I don't see him any longer. <laughs> but people hear different things and you know, when you're, in a, when you're in a situation like that. So bring people and then talk about what you heard and maybe what you didn't hear. This is where people become so, so very important on our journey. Iron sharpens iron. We need them with us. We need them praying for us and praying for our families. We are surrounded by a community of believers sitting right here tonight who are willing to step in in any way that they can, if given the chance, they'll do what they can for us. We have to lean on them. God has put them in our path for a reason. Utilize them. Having a spokesman, uh, someone who can update your friends and family, I found to be a great resource. It can become overwhelming to try to keep everybody in the loop. Tell the story again and again and again. I honestly don't know how people get through hard times without God. Now, I know it happens, but I just think it's so much better with God. How do you receive the hope and the love that God offers and the prayers of God's people if you don't have God and God's people in your corner? No matter where you are or what's going on in your life, let people in and allow them to help you and to walk alongside of you, no matter what. Now, my oncologist told me that I would have an 8% chance of my cancer returning within 10 years if I did chemo and radiation. So I had a port put in, and I started chemo. Three days after my first chemo session, my daughter Hunter joined me, and we went downtown to the St. Baldrick's Day events, and we shaved our heads. And this is a picture. About 25 people showed up during that time and all shaved their heads in unity with me. The church didn't know what to think. <laughs> <laughs> but it was beyond amazing, and I will be eternally grateful for all the people who have shown up for my family. We need each other. You will be truly blessed by allowing people in. Allow people to join you on your journey. It can really help ease the fear and the worry that we experience. Don't push them aside or try to protect them. They want to be there with you. Allow them to be, let them be. And remember, it's okay to laugh during hard times. Laughter is so good for the soul. About three quarters of the way through my chemo treatment, I ended up in the hospital. And it was the very first time I ever thought I may die. I wasn't able to breathe, and I didn't know if the next breath was actually gonna come. So eventually my doctors came in and they said that they thought my cancer had spread to my lungs. They wanted to um, transport me to Peoria. I asked to go home. I had had enough. I told them that I did not believe that the cancer had spread, and I might have told them that I believed they didn't know how to treat me. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just saying, I might have. But so my family, my loving family, um, made sure that I made it down to Peoria. So off to Peoria I went, but. But during this time, during your journey, find your voice and don't be afraid to use it. It's okay to question and have conversations about what's happening, especially in your own body. Like, don't be afraid. It's your body, it's your life, it's your journey. Ask, get the answers that you're looking for. On this journey, you will hear and be told horrible, terrible things that are going on. Ask God to protect your heart and your mind. It's so easy to go to those dark places. Don't. Pray. Have people praying for you, with you. Memorize some scripture to hold on to during those uncertain times. God is right there with us, and his strength will carry us in our weakness. It was so heart-wrenching to watch my family go through this, to see the looks on my children's faces when they knew I wasn't feeling good, the worried look when I coughed or I had pain in my body, we try to be so strong for everybody else. I had so much hope and faith that God was being strong for me and that he was fighting in my weakness. In life, we will run into mountains. 
All those mountains might look differently, but we will have them. I pray that each of you, whether it's cancer you're dealing with or whatever it is, I pray that you are so grounded in your relationship with Jesus and that you know how much God loves you and how much he is for you. I pray that you are trusting in him and believing in him. And I pray that you know that he is not against you and he is not punishing you for something that you may have done. That is not the God that we serve. I had complete faith that God was gonna heal me, but I prayed daily that that healing was gonna take place here on earth and not in heaven. Because I am not ready to die. You are not ready to die. We need prayer warriors lifting us up. No issue is too small. I did not tell people initially about the lump that I found because I thought, who needs to be praying about an infection? You know, that whole nurse thing. Crossbridge is filled with prayer warriors. You have to allow people in and be honest about where you are. And don't let your pride fool you into thinking that you can do this alone. I had to come to the realization that I am not superwoman. Well, cancer had not spread to my lungs and it was finally, I was finally able to go home and breathe. It was determined later that I had had a reaction to the chemo and now it was on to radiation. So 34 treatments. I hated radiation. I hated going there five days a week. I hated the burns that it left on my skin. I hated laying on that stupid table, being while they're radiating me for what seemed to be an eternity, I was ready to get on with my life and this was slowing me down. And that still small voice would pop up every once in a while and, you know, and tell me to take it slow, tell me that I needed to take care of myself. Um, but I didn't listen. I was afraid to slow down. I felt like if I slowed down, cancer was gonna win and I felt like I was giving up and I was not gonna let cancer beat me. Finally, in August of 2014, I got the all clear, remission. Praise the Lord. I had my port taken out and I never looked back. I was able to look to God with thanks and praise him for all that he did for me and my family during this time. Not only did he heal me, but my mom also started a relationship with Jesus. And so I was so very thankful to have walked that and for that to be the ending. My family saw how God showed up through it all. Yes, there were bumps in the road, there was pain and fear, there was worry and anxiety, but there was always hope, there was always God, and there was victory. I was able to love deeper, allow people closer, and live with a deeper faith. God is always for us. On Tuesday, April 28th of 2015, I woke up with a pain just below my knee. I did not go to sleep with that pain, and I had not hit my knee during the night, but I went to the ER because the pain had gotten so bad and nothing was helping during the week. So on that Friday morning, I went back to the ER and by the grace of God, they had one opening left for a CAT scan. When I got out of the machine, the tech said to me, well now you'll have some answers. So I knew right away that they had found something. By the time I had gotten back to my room in the ER, my mom said that the doctor had come in and wanted to know who my oncologist was. I told her they saw something in the scan. The doctor came back in and he told me that I had a three centimeter spot embedded into my knee or into my bone and that they assumed that it was cancer and that my oncologist wanted to see me that afternoon. This time, the tears came instantly. This time, I thought, God, I don't want to have cancer again. I told him that I already walked this journey and that was enough for me. I told him I could relate to the people with cancer just fine. I was willing to go and reach people for him, but I did not want to walk this journey again. But God has a plan and he did not need my direction and he did not ask for my opinion. <laughs> so this time my mom was the strong one. She assured me that everything was gonna be fine, that God was in charge and that God loved me and she said that I had taught her that. So after what seemed like a whirlwind of scans, all these doctor's appointments, painful bone marrow testing, it was finally determined that my breast cancer had spread to my bones. It was not a new type of cancer, which the doctor said was a good thing, but I had lots of questions. Like, how could I just only make it eight months in remission? 
Like, how do you just wake up with a three centimeter tumor in your bone? No warning, no pain until that morning. What happened to my 8% chance of the cancer returning in 10 years? The doctor told me that cancer so rarely develops below your elbows or knees that they don't ever check for it. So we were talking treatment options, and I could hear this, this panic in her voice. Um, but I didn't understand. I wasn't following her. And so finally I stopped her and I said, I'm not following what you're saying. I can hear the urgency of what you're saying, but I'm missing something. Like, I don't understand why you're panicking. Well, she turned towards me and as bluntly as she could, told me that I had stage four breast cancer. There was no cure. That I would be treated for cancer for the rest of my life and that treatments needed to start ASAP. And then, as, that, as though that was not bad enough, she proceeded to tell me that my type of cancer only has a 24% survival rate at five years, and that I would, for the rest of my life, have cancer. I would never, ever again be in remission. Well, that changes things, I thought. So this time, all I could do was hold on to God for dear life, complete dependency, which is a really great place to be, but a really horrible way to get there. I kept hearing, no cure, no cure. But then it hit me, you don't know my God. He determines my steps, and he determines when he calls me home. Not you, and not cancer. I'll choose to put my trust and faith in him and follow his steps for me, no matter where they lead. This time, it was different. This time, I kept thinking, what did I miss? Like, what am I not getting? What didn't I not learn the first time around that God was trying to tell me? I just really felt like there was something and I just wasn't getting it. I was circling that mountain instead of getting to go up and over it. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord will personally go ahead of you. He will be with you. He will neither fail you nor abandon you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Lord Almighty will personally go ahead of you, that he'll never fail you or abandon you? Because I do. I believe it wholeheartedly. And I think that believing that can really bring your journey out of the darkness and into hope. I know that it's hard to not be afraid and to not be discouraged when you're going through hard times. There's so much unknown. There can be so much fear in the unknown. But we know the one who knows. We know the one who goes before us and is with us and won't fail us. Believe in that and find your hope in that. I received radiation in the tumor on my leg and the next scan showed two more tumors in my ribs. The oncologist suggested that we wait six months and see what happens. I thought, I have stage four breast cancer. I could be dead in six months. Oncologist number two, out of there. <laughs> So because of this conversation, I had a friend um, who also was a nurse, and she was able to point me to an oncologist that she used to work for. So see, we need each other. We need to tell people what our needs are because they're not mind readers. No matter what it is or no matter how minute you think it may be, my family could not have gotten through this if it wasn't for this community of believers who love us, who circle around us, who pray and support us, who show up and listen. I'm not so worried, I'm not so much worried about what I go through, but I'm very worried about how my kids view God. I don't want them to blame God or be mad at him because I have cancer. Don't get me wrong, it's okay to be mad at God as long as you don't stay there. You have to move on from that. My new oncologist has been great, and I was started on chemo pills, and the tumors in my ribs went away. I've been on those chemo pills ever since, but in February of this year, I had another PET scan done. There was another tumor. Only this time, this tumor grew while I had been taking the chemo. This one was so embedded into my leg that they were afraid that radiation was gonna crack my entire leg. This one got my attention like never before. For weeks, all I could do was cry out to God, not about why, but about leaving my family. That 24% kept creeping back into my mind, taking me to the dark places that I did not want to be. 
There's only a few options for me treatment-wise, and so I need, to get the long, I need to get longevity out of each treatment so I can stay off IV chemo for as long as possible. I thought this time I needed to start writing my goodbyes to my children. Satan was just hammering me with the thoughts that I was not going to be here much longer and that my kids were gonna, going to grow up and be left without a mom. I felt like I needed to start the journals to tell them about their futures that I was not going to get to be a part of. It was so heart-wrenching to think, to think about, and I just couldn't bring myself to start those journals because Satan doesn't get to win. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. James says that we are to consider trials as a reason for great joy because trials are capable of producing good results in us. Trials can also easily produce bitterness in us instead of helping us become better. How we allow the trial to be used in our life is the issue, and whether faith, hope, and love are allowed to produce endurance in us while we're facing the storms of our life. I believe that God can use our storms to lead us in the right direction, to change our direction if needed. He can use painful situations to change our ways if we allow him to. God has healed me of my pride and people pleasing, of my unreal expectations of myself. I learned that the most important things in life, I learned what the most important things in life and my life were and I made changes so that my priorities matched up to how God wanted them to be. I try to live each day in the moment, making as many memories as I can and enjoying the journey along the way. God has also healed me of my low self-worth, and now I believe his promises for my life and not the lies that I have believed for so long. God has healed me of so much more through my cancer journey. God used cancer to get my attention so I could allow him to mold me into the person that he created me to be. It's always been so much easier for me to believe the lies of who I'm not than the beauty of who God says I am. Cancer is now just an afterthought. It's a chronic condition that I'll have until the day I die, unless God has a different plan, either of which I'm okay with. I have more tumors, but I happily surrender them to, to God each and every day and not think twice about them. But I didn't get there overnight. It was a process, and it came from believing in who God says he is and putting my hope and faith in that. I tell my children, whatever happens, don't be mad at God. Don't ask why. Believe he needed me to walk this journey and I am happy to be obedient. But no, I fully expect to see you again in heaven. And in order for that to happen, you need to continue your relationship with Jesus. That's your choice that I pray that you will continue to make for your life. That's the way that we get to see each other again, no matter when God calls me home. That's my hope and prayer for them and for their life. It's my job to give them the foundation to build on. It's my journey that they will model after. I want it to lead to God and for God to get all the glory. Whatever you're going through, God is there and he's with you. He is cheering you on. You can overcome whatever it is because you are an overcomer. Believe that. Allow God to help you find victory. Allow him to spread his hope and his love and his mercy on you and receive it. Share it with others. God really is good. And if you're a survivor, I want you to know that you are an inspiration to all of those who know you. Walking in faith, seeking God's strength. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you know every hair on our head. Lord, you know every thought. And Lord, you know right where we are and where we wish we could be. Lord, I pray tonight that there is healing. Lord, I pray that there is turning from a bad direction. Lord, I pray that we're able to climb out of that darkness knowing that you are right there. Lord, that you love us and that you want what's best for us. 
Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. Lord, thank you for your grace and your hope. Lord, thank you for the people around us that you have placed in our lives. Lord, help us to be open. Lord, help us to be honest about where we are and what we need. And Lord, help us to continue to keep our eyes on you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.